Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I welcome Ellie Pashley, who is a 10,000 meter runner and marathon runner who represented Australia at the World Championships in Doha recently. She's also a Tokyo 2021, not 2020, Olympic hopeful after ach achieving a qualifying time in both the 10K and the marathon. Ellie is also a physiotherapist, and I graduated with Ellie from Charles Sturt University many moons ago. Her PBs include a two hour 26 marathon, which is, I did the math on it, a 3.46 minute Ks, which is crazy. One hour and nine minute half marathon, which is 3.27 minute Ks. And a 31 minutes, 18 second 10K, which is at 3.1 minute Ks, which is flying. Huge welcome to Ellie Pashley. Thanks, Wildy. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Really looking forward to it. And I've listened to a fair few of your podcasts in the last probably few months that you've been on prior and we've discussed that it's going to be less about you, which you'll love because you're so modest and more about, <laughs> and more about running. How's everything going at the moment? It's a bit, you're a bit injured, I hear. Yeah. So I've got a little bit of a foot injury happening at the moment, which is actually not too bad because there's no racing or anything happening so timing is okay but yeah I've, I've never really been injured before so I'm not uh, coping very well with not being able to to run as normal but um yeah it's probably a good experience for me learning to be patient and do the right thing by it rather than trying to push it so yeah do the, do the things you always tell your clients <laughs> exactly yeah I was a pretty naughty patient for the first couple of weeks but uh yeah I'm, I'm doing the right thing now giving so it time you're enjoying isolation life working from home doing all those things yeah it hasn't been too bad um I didn't initially it was a little bit boring the clinic that I work at in Torquay we closed for about six weeks I think so I wasn't doing much work to start with but um we're back we're back open now and pretty much business as usual so uh yeah it's a nice mix of working in the clinic and working from home and a bit of training and things like that so it's okay just no yeah. races yeah exactly when are you when are you predicting that races will kick off again has there been a word yeah we're not really sure so uh london marathon which was initially in april got postponed until october and we're hearing that at this stage, that's still going to go ahead in some format. So it might be an elite only race of a looped course or something. But um, if that happens, then we're hoping to go. But it depends on whether we're allowed to leave the country and come back and all of those things. So it's probably just going to be waiting until I reckon August or so till we have a better idea of whether or not we can go. Well, but hopefully then. Would you do it if you had to do two weeks of quarantine when you get there and then two weeks of quarantine when you get back? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah. You'd go crazy, pretty... wouldn't you? Would you would you get a oh, treadmill I... would you get a treadmill set up where you where you'd bunk it down bunk it down in uh in London? Yeah, I think the plan if we go over there setting up a um like some kind of compound for the athletes. So we'll be able to train in there and it, it will be a little uh, less restrictive. I think it'll be more after when we come home, if we have to quarantine in a hotel room for two weeks here, that would be the bit I'd struggle with. But I mean, after a marathon, you don't really feel like doing much for the first week anyway, but uh, week two would be a bit of a nightmare. So we'll see. It'll depend on what the regulations are by then. Mm. Mm. If I could quarantine at home, I'd be happy to, but yeah, I'm not sure about a hotel room. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun at all. No. Nah. So, Ellie, back to your background early on. Obviously, you played a lot of sport. So, you played yeah. football and you played other different sports. Just talk to me, talk to the listeners, I suppose, about your background in terms of sport because you're not just a runner and you really only took up running seriously probably about, what, five years ago, a bit longer? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so growing up, I played, I, I did do athletics and cross country and things like that as a kid, uh, but I played netball, basketball, touch footy, swimming, water polo, a bit of everything uh, through my teenage years. And then 
yeah, while I was at uni, I was still playing netball and basketball. And then I sort of gradually transitioned across to running probably late later in uni and then um, more so once I finished. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I gave up netball maybe five or six years ago for good. And that was when I decided to focus on running and start training for a marathon. Remember back to the good old mixed netball days on a Wednesday night in Albury? <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. Yeah, they Enjoy. were good times. You and I up up in the Ford line, me at GS, you at GA. Yeah, yeah, that was fun actually. The, yeah. the uni sport. I do, but, I do miss it. It was so much fun. Yeah, I think I would struggle now if I got put back on a on a court or on a touch footy field or something. It's been a while since I've done the change of direction, <laughs> explosive type sport. Yeah, exactly. And just for the a bit of context as well, back in uni days, I used to occasionally, and I emphasise occasionally, run with Ellie. And it used to really piss me off. The whole time we were running, she would talk. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're cruising along. And I thought I was a decent runner, you know, background of Aussie rules. And the whole time we're running and we're going at a decent clip, she's just talking and I'm like dying. <laughs> you are fine. I remember we used to do some, must have been when we were on placement, we went and started doing a few running sessions down at a footy oval together somewhere in Sydney, I think it was actually. Yeah, it was a placement we had at Greenwich, remember? At the old, yeah. uh, it, was, it was like rehab. Rehab was actually, hospital. Yeah, I was actually telling the story the other day about how, do you remember that we had that like 85 year old lady and she had a, a bilateral knee replacement? Do you remember her? Uh, anyway, she, she, her, her name was Agnes, I think, or something like that. And the poor, <laughs> the poor thing, like she'd had the bilateral knee. She was too old for it. I, I don't know who did it, but the poor thing would walk about 100 metres in about three hours. And you'd be like, oh, it's okay, Agnes, keep going, keep going. And you're just like, you poor thing. I remember that was probably the, the, only, the only memory of, memory I've got of that, other than obviously doing the running sessions with you. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember much of that placement at all, but yeah, the training after work was good. Yeah, exactly. Now, Elle, what are some of the biggest running mistakes people make, do you think? And when I say running mistakes, I'm talking more of your long distance runners, because I think considering the, the COVID situation, a lot of people have been running a lot more than they normally do, purely because gyms have been closed, that sort of thing. What are some of the big mistakes people make? Yeah, so definitely the number one mistake that people make is increasing things too quickly. So whether that's increasing their volume or their mileage, um, increasing their pace or sort of adding too many new variables at once. So sometimes people get a bit excited and they might ramp up their Ks and at the same time they start running faster or they add in some speed sessions or long runs or something like that. So yeah, I think the, the big thing is you want to increase one variable at a time and just small increments. So it might be, yeah, over, over a number of weeks, you're sort of increasing your volume by 10 or 20% as opposed to, to doubling the distance of your runs and things like that in the early stages. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of they don't factor in intensity and they don't factor in other variables. They're just thinking purely black and white, either time or distance. It's still yeah. something you need to factor in, in terms of volume. And I'm putting volume in inverted commas there. So there are more factors than just distance or time, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, another big thing that we see as well is people doing all of their runs too fast so yes this is huge let's talk about this <laughs> yes so people who might go out and run three or four times a week and every single run is just flat knacker as fast as they as they can for four or five k's or something like that so a big thing that we focus on uh, with the athletes that we work with is uh, breaking their week up so there might be a mix of easy runs or recovery runs um, then you've got your higher intensity workouts whether that's sort of speed work or tempo work or there's lots of different um, ways you can add intensity and then even different distances as well so some days you might you might run a, a shorter run and then there might be one longer run during the week as well so just breaking the week up 
uh, so that every single run's not all out and the same distance. Yeah, exactly. And doing different things all the time is definitely also going to help with continuing to run and you're not going to get bored. That's another big thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It makes it a little bit more fun. And one more thing about that. So say, for instance, someone was doing 20 kilometres per week over, say, three or four runs. How many of those kilometres, and I know there's so many ways to skin a cat, but how many of those kilometres roughly, if you're just kind of just a weekend warrior, should you be doing those kilometres at a slower pace? Or your yeah, recovery so, type of setup? So, yeah, with, I mean, with, uh, with 20 kilometres a week, your percentage of easy versus hard can be a little bit higher, but you wouldn't really want to be doing more than, you know, somewhere between five and seven kilometers a week at any, any real intensity. So for somebody that's running high volume, you might look at their uh, intense percentage being somewhere between, between 10 and 20, whereas someone with lower volume, it could be closer to sort of 30% or so um, at that higher intensity. But yeah, the vast majority of your kilometers should be easy pace. So if you're doing, say, for instance, 50 kilometres per week, you're not going to be doing much at all at a higher intensity? No, no. Yes. And it might just be if you run 50 k's a week, say, and you're doing one of your days is a hard day, even within that hard day, if it's a 10-kilometre run, it's probably not even going to be the whole 10 kilometres at that pace. So you've got your warm-up and your cool down. It might be that within that 10-kilometre run you're doing – know six kilometers at a tempo pace or intervals that make up five or six kilometers or something like that so yeah it's it's actually a fairly low percentage of your week that's done at a hard effort yeah and it's so important for the people to understand I, i've been harping on about this for so many years but also recently because i've seen so many injuries because people have gone into lockdown and in, into this current situation and they've gone berserk you know they've gone from doing you know a couple of runs a week and they're going to five or six runs per week and they're just not factoring in intensity, distance, time. They're just, they're going for it. And the biggest thing is they're not doing enough Ks at a slow intensity and they think that they should just flog themselves and it's just not the way to do it, is it? Yeah, no, you're right. I think, um, I think yeah, vo volume or, or mileage is actually probably the most important factor in, building fitness and to get that you have to spend a lot of time running at that slower pace because if you it's impossible to keep building your mileage if you're just smashing yourself all the time you'll end up completely injured and worn out so yeah it's it is tricky but um and it takes a little bit of patience because often you'll running's really hard when you first start and you get three or four weeks in and you start feeling really good and it gets easier and that's that's where that danger zone is, I think, in that sort of from four weeks to 12-week period where you're feeling good, but you don't yet have that cumulative fatigue in your legs and your body hasn't started to break down as such. But if you keep just smashing away and increasing things at the same rate, then that's often where you come unstuck in that next, next little phase. But if you do it sensibly, there's no reason why you can't keep building up without getting injured. Exactly. Suck up the ego and slowly build. That's the big thing. And a lot of people I yep. find use running as a punishment, especially, especially as a punishment for eating, you know, too many calories one day or whatever it is, or they have a big meal or something like that. And they're like, I need to go for a run. And I talk about it all the time. Obviously energy balance is going to dictate what you weigh, but you shouldn't be using your runs as punishment. You should. And I often say this, you know, exercise is a celebration of what you can do, not what you you know, it shouldn't be a punishment for what you've eaten or a punishment for not exercising enough recently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think, um, yeah, I think it's probably a healthier, healthier mindset to, to use exercise more as a, a tool for your health and your fitness rather than, um, yeah, <laughs> punishing yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the one huge question as well so i harp about this harp on about this with my clients that are long distance runners and not enough of them do speed work and sprint work and running training and sprinting training how important is it how much of your week is um, in that higher threshold and also how much sprint training have you done over the years 
Yeah, that's that's a good point because there's uh, with long distance running there are a few different training styles, I guess. But we certainly in our general training phase, so that would be outside of a specific marathon block. We'll do one session per week that's a speed or VO two base session. And then on one or two other days, we'll do some strides, which are, it might be six by a hundred meters or something at somewhere between 80 to 90%. So the speed and VO2 sessions, the point of them is to touch on that anaerobic system, um, try and help increase our anaerobic threshold and lactate clearance and all of those sort of things. So we, we might do intervals. We tend not to do anything really less than probably two or 300 meters on those days and we'll do a number of reps. So we don't, we don't necessarily do, you know, two or three times 200 meters all out. It might be more like 15 by 300 meters with a decent amount of rest in between um, targeting like a 1500 meter pace or something like that. But um, yeah, I think it, it's really important for, for improving your form, um, strength, neuromuscular, activation and things like that and then we we tend to use strides on the days in between again just to facilitate that neuromuscular system and activate certain muscles without really fatiguing them so the strides can be done on a recovery day because they're not really going to take much out of you but they're going to keep that fast leg turnover happening and um, yeah it, it's a good chance to focus on form because in a lot of your slower, longer, easier runs, sometimes form goes out the window a little bit just because you don't need to recruit the same way that you do when you're running harder. So, yeah, so we, I would just do one session per week, usually that, um, I guess, focuses on that, that speed or anaerobic system and then just a couple of short strides added onto my easy runs. Great answer. And in regards to rest periods, when you are doing those 200 to 300 meter efforts, how long are we looking at normally sort of resting? Obviously there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, but also it depends on where you are in season probably as well, but roughly. Yeah. Uh, it would probably vary between 30 and 60 seconds for those ones. Yeah. So we're like often it's not really long enough to, completely recover to the point that you're you can go at 100 percent again it's you probably still want a little bit of that lactic acid to be present in your in your system so yeah it usually it would be around 60 seconds if we're doing 300 meter or 400 meter reps and sometimes yeah. shorter if we're trying to um do a more continuous lactic type session now a lot of people have asked me to ask you this how the hell do you cope with the distance and how the hell do you mentally cope with the pain? Because personally, look, I don't run a lot anymore. And when I do, it's normally I sprint and running is running is hard. Running is bloody hard. And a lot of people just struggle with it in terms of the mental capacity of dealing with K after K and, you know, even um, the total volume per week. How do you deal with it? Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's something that happens over time, to be honest. So I was certainly one of those people as well that found it really hard to run for a long period of time without getting bored. And I didn't like that feeling of fatigue, I guess, that you get from those long runs. But the more that I've done it, I think the more that I've grown to enjoy it in a weird, sick way. And <laughs> to be honest, I, I find, um, I find shorter harder speed work much more painful than long tempos and marathon style training so for me to go and run a 14k tempo I would prefer to do that than go and run eight 400s as hard as I can because it's a lot more physically painful I think to do the shorter harder stuff the the fatigue that you get from the longer distances which and similar to the fatigue that you get in the marathon is it's a different sort of feeling it's more just um it's like your muscles or your legs, they're not, they're not responding <laughs> rather yeah, yeah. than actually being painful. It's more like a heaviness and a, you need yeah, a, crutch. It's a different sort of sensation. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I actually, yeah, I think, I think you get used to the feeling and it's, 
I kind of like it. <laughs> and in terms of those longer runs, you know, your training runs, if you're ever training by yourself, obviously you would. What do you do? Do you listen to music? How do you get through the longer distance um, sessions? Yeah, I, um, I do a lot of my long runs with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, so often on a Sunday, we'll go and run 30 Ks or so in a group. If we're, if we're in the lead into a marathon and we're doing, we'll often do a workout within our long run. So we might do marathon paced intervals within a, say a 35 K run. That's a bit harder to do with people, but I don't, I don't tend to find that as, as challenging because you're concentrating on your pace and the way that you feel and you're taking on fuel and hydration throughout the run to practice all of those things for race day. So I don't actually really get particularly bored in those ones, to be honest. And I don't, I listen to podcasts um, or music sometimes on my shorter, easy runs, but I don't really tend to listen to them on the longer ones and particularly not the longer, harder ones. But I think the best thing you can do is find people to run with because yeah. The more mileage you're doing, the more important it is to have people around you. I think it, it makes it so much more enjoyable and the time goes by so much more quickly. But I, I don't mind every now and then doing, doing a long, hard session on my own just to kind of get in that zone and get a, you get a little bit more of a feel for where you're at and, and what your marathon pace might feel like on the day. So sometimes it's good to do a couple of those solo. Yeah, cool. And I've heard you mention it before that you sort of fell in love with running in the last sort of four or five years when things became more of a team sport in a way, because previously you thought it was a lot, it felt a little bit more like an individual sport. But now you've got obviously your running partners and everything. You said that you kind of fell in love with it because it was more social. How important yeah, is that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, I think that's been a big thing. I'm a relatively social person and and I always loved team sports growing up and that was probably the thing the thing that I found most challenging with running was that I didn't really um, have many people my age that that I were into running I guess probably you were one of the few people that I I used to run with when I was at uni um, so for me you, dra you dragged me along you mean <laughs> I was just dying yeah. <laughs> But even like I was very unmotivated to run through that part of my life unless I had somebody that would, was actually keen to, to do it with me. So, yeah, I think once I moved to Geelong, I, I sort of started meeting people um, that I got along with really well and we, we ended up just forming a little, a little training group and a lot of those guys are still the people that I run with now. And, yeah, we – like most people have got a uh, normal full-time jobs and normal lives outside of running, but um, they still are really into, into their running as well. So I think, I think it's a good, uh, a good mix. Normal people that, <laughs> that like running. Sometimes that's a bit hard to find. Um, so yeah, that, that for me has been a big part of making it enjoyable enough for me to want to do it all the time for sure. Do you miss netball at all? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. I miss when I go and watch my sisters still play netball in Geelong and, and sometimes when I go and watch them play, particularly in finals, those big, exciting games, I, I miss that competitive side of it and, and the social side of it as well. Netball was really good fun, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think I'm happy doing what I'm doing now. I might go back to it maybe later on, but. Are you surfing at all? Seeing you're on the surf coast. Oh no, I haven't surfed for about probably over a year now. Yeah. I, I was surfing a little bit, but it just now I I don't really have time to be honest with if I run twice a day then I tend not to do much else. I'm pretty <laughs> pretty lazy outside of that. So yeah, I haven't been surfing for a long time. It's too bloody cold down there anyway. Uh, yeah. It's about twelve degrees in the water oh. at the moment. Couldn't do it. It's cold enough here in Sydney. I nearly have to wear a wetsuit all year round up here. Now, in terms of running, so obviously a lot of runners talk about they kind of find the flow. How do you find the flow when you are running? What's something you use? Um, I don't know. I think for me, a big part of it is where I'm running. So I really like the, the trails and we're quite lucky down here where I live. There's lots of trails that go along the coast. So there's nice views and 
there's little rainforests and um, some good climbing out the back of the town areas inlet where I live. So for me to get into a flow, it often, um, I need to be running in a nice place. I don't really enjoy just running around the streets very much. In a race, I think it, it just so, sort of happens. If you're having a good day and you're feeling good, you can almost just completely switch off and, and find that um, the pace that should normally feel quite challenging uh, just becomes comfortable. So, yeah, it, it, it doesn't always happen and there's definitely days where it's a grind and I don't enjoy a second of, of my runs or <laughs> races. But, um, yeah, if, you, if you're lucky enough to get those days where it all just flows, then that's a pretty nice feeling. The good days outweigh the bad by the sounds of it. Yeah, I think so. So how many days off per week do you have? And when I say days off, I mean nothing pretty much. So no strength training, no running, nothing. Uh, zero. Zero. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I run every day. Running yeah. every day. Yeah. And cool. I do, I strength, I do strength training. I'm pretty uh, slack with my strength, but I do do it twice a week. Yep. Um, and I try to do my strength training on my hard running days so that then the days in between are recovery days. So I'll still run on the recovery days, but they'll just be easy pace um, runs. So they're not too taxing. And what are the focus exercises that you're doing during your strength training sessions and focus muscle groups? Um, yeah, so it, it's pretty pretty basic sort of strength stuff but um i guess focusing on calves hammies quads glutes a little bit of core very minimal upper body but um, <laughs> <laughs> there's probably one or two upper body exercises in there safe to say um, your biceps have never been your strongest <laughs> no. yeah no they've probably dwindled away even more than <laughs> when you last saw me too um yeah, so it's I do I do a different session. Uh, so Tuesday and Friday I do it, and it's different each time. But yeah, a big focus. I've done a lot of work recently on my calves because I had a perineal tendon issue, mm -hmm. um, and I'm pretty weak through my calves basically. So I just do some heavy weighted calf raises, and uh, yeah, nothing nothing too extravagant at the moment. It's a little bit tricky because our gyms are still closed down here. So it's all home base stuff, but um, I've got some equipment here that I've been using and then hopefully I can get back in the gym and start using the machines again as of next week. So that's I was good. I was always pretty jealous of your calves at uni. My calves? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was never, they're not very I, good. <laughs> I'm not blessed in the calf department, thanks, Dad. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you got I'm, skinny legs. <laughs> no, they're, they're a bit bigger than last time you saw me, I reckon. But, but Are I, they? <laughs> the, the old calves, I smash them, but they're just not getting bigger. It's I think I'm nearly I'm nearly yeah. time to up. I think you're fighting your genetics. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Graham. <laughs> you can have some of mine. Mine are probably a bit too big for a girl's. They're just not very strong. Yeah, but at the same time, they're obviously they're, they're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, they they're going okay. You're an elite but athlete. Yeah, the, the tricky thing that um that I guess I find with the strength stuff is. I know in theory we should be probably lifting fairly heavy, um, but it's the more mileage that I do, the more fatigued I am in the legs basically all the time. And I find it quite hard to lift as, as heavily as I probably could just because of how tired my legs are to begin with and then how sore I get from that kind of work after which then can sort of roll over and affect my session a couple of days later so it's a it's a little bit of a juggling act as mileage goes up with the strength you've really got to you still have to do it but you have to find that right amount that's uh, manageable with your training load as well which in the past I definitely haven't done enough but I'm getting I'm getting better so twice a week for you at the moment with your strength training <laughs> yeah twice a week's about all I can really fit in. I probably could do a little bit more on, on another day, but um, yeah. You'd rather, just, you'd rather just run more, wouldn't you? I'd rather just run more. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's, it's a fine line as well because you, you know, obviously you get the performance benefits from 
the strength training, but you also get the performance benefits from more mileage. So it's, it's trying to find, I guess, the amount of mileage that you can tolerate and then putting the strength on top of that. Um, if you can't tolerate high mileage, that's where sometimes you can use additional strength work to try and get that, those extra, you know, 10% or whatever that you might not be able to get from mileage. Find a, another way to achieve that. Sounds good. I was reading an article about you today, actually, and I saw one of your coach, Julian Spence, he, there was this great quote when he was summing you up and he said, she shuts the fuck up and gets it done. <laughs> <laughs> I found That's it very funny. amusing. Now, segue, segue from that. So how far off your peak do you think you are? Because you're still, you, uh, in marathon running terms, you're still very, very young in terms of your, I suppose, your training age. Because really, you've only been doing marathons. I think your first marathon was 2016. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. About four years ago. Yeah. And it was a, two, yeah. it was a 246 straight up and you left a bit in the tank from memory. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, in Mel at Melbourne Marathon in 2016. I think... Um, that's a tricky one. I, I think I don't know that I have much more to give in the shorter distances. So I can't really see myself running a hell of a lot faster over 10 K and I'm, I'm certainly not a, not a speed athlete anyway. So I, I think that I'm probably almost at my limit in the shorter distances. Whereas the marathon, it, it takes so many more years to develop that endurance and, a lot of it is experience and years and years of training back to back, I think where you can really improve in that distance. So I'm hoping that I still have, have a bit more to give in, in the marathon event, but um, yeah, it's just, it's hard to know with, with injuries and, and how long your body can handle it for, but I, I'd like to think that I could maybe do it for another 10 years if I'm lucky and I don't know, maybe, maybe peak in my late thirties, but it will all depend on, yeah, how the body holds up, I guess. One of the cafes in Sydney at North Bondi um, called Depot. Have you ever been there? Heather Turland, I think owns. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, anyway, she, she was, I think 36 or 37 in Kuala Lumpur in 1998 and won the marathon gold and the, um, the Commonwealth games. So obviously yeah, you cool. can, and I think she'd had three or four kids by then. And this segues yeah. into my next question. What's plans going forward um, for you in terms of life after running? So say, for instance, in three, four years' time, you've had enough and you, you want to retire. What do you, what's the plan for Ellie Pashley going forward? Uh, yeah, to be honest, I don't really think too much <laughs> ahead <laughs> as far as that goes. Like, to, to be honest, I, wanna, I actually want to keep running for a really long time. And, and if I can make that, even a part-time job for the next 10 years, I'd be really happy with that. Uh, the, the tricky part, I think, as a female in your 30s is trying to plan in if and when you want to have kids. Mm. So obviously, yeah, that, that means taking time away from the sport and then there's the recovery and then there's trying to fit it in with things like Olympic cycles and Commonwealth Games and all the major major championships so my next yeah five ten years is going to be probably trying to juggle the two whether it's running trying to have a family um, I'm keen to still keep working as a physio while I can in that time as well and and doing some coaching work I mean I'm I'm enjoying the mix that I've got at the moment and I think it's it's fairly sustainable um, we're lucky in physio that we can we can sort of work part time and, and I'm lucky the clinic that I'm at, they allow me to travel and go away for events and things like that. So yeah, I, if I can keep doing what I'm doing, then I'd be, I'd be pretty happy. And then once, once running's done and dusted, I think I, I think I would like to stay in, in the running world as far as whether it's sort of molding physio to go more down that pathway or whether it's focusing more on coaching as opposed to, to working as a physio going forwards i'm not really sure but i'd like to amalgamate them all together somehow if i can sounds great i think that sounds like a really good plan going forward it's also it's also good to kind of 
take your physio hat off sometimes and have something else other than just physio. Like obviously I do a lot of strength conditioning work myself and I've kind of, I get that really good break per day where it's not just client after client that's injured. I've got a lot of clients yeah. that are trying to optimize performance or they want to get stronger or they want to build some muscle or they're trying to lose weight or whatever it is. So that I think having a balance like you've got is definitely something you need going forward. Yeah. And it's this, like similar to with what you're doing with the running coaching, it's, it's actually really nice working with people that are super motivated and they want, they've got these goals that they want to achieve and they, they literally do everything that you tell them to do. And they're so, they want to know why they're doing things. And it's, I, I really, that's probably the side of coaching that most surprised me. Um, yeah, I enjoy, it's sort of very similar to physio in a lot of ways. Like a lot of it is load management and um, education and things like that. But it's, it's working with highly motivated people, which is, as you would know, in the strength and conditioning world as well, it's, it's actually a bit of a breath of fresh air sometimes. <laughs> Oh, seriously. And someone that's super motivated is just so great to work with because as you said, if you give them something and you tell them to do something, they do it. It is, yeah. It's really rewarding as well because when they throw themselves into it and then they see all these great results, well, they're, they're thinking you're like a god and you're like, well, yeah, yeah I, I put things on paper for you and I plan things, but you had to do it. And, you know, they yeah, throw themselves exactly. straight into it. So good. So I completely agree. Now, in terms of being a physio, has that made you a better athlete in terms of being able to manage load, manage injuries, these type of things? Yeah, I think so. I think um, probably the biggest thing that it has helped with is that early intervention. So whenever I feel a niggle coming on or, you know, if I'm noticing something when I'm running, I can... I guess pinpoint where what might be causing it and try and make small changes straight away to offload that area. So I think having that physio knowledge has definitely helped in that way. Um, sometimes it's I've noticed particularly lately with these few more serious niggles that I've had that it's it is good to seek outside help as well because I often know in my head what I would be telling people to do, but sometimes it's nice to have somebody. <laughs> external tell you what to do as well because when it's when you're treating yourself you can uh you can sometimes twist things to suit what you want to be doing like for me with this foot injury recently I really didn't want to lose fitness because of the prospect of London Marathon happening so I was definitely going the approach of let's just try and get rid of it as quickly as possible but without losing any fitness which was essentially um probably just pushing it too soon as soon as it settled each time. So, um, yeah, I think it's definitely helpful in that early intervention phase and knowing what to do uh, to manage injuries when they first come on. But I think it's also important to, to get other people to have input too so that you're not just, yeah, treating yourself constantly. Oh, I completely agree. Physios need physios. Physios need strength coaches. You know, you can't do it all. And you, you can't treat yourself. And you're, as you said, you need external help sometimes, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, how fast do you think you can run the marathon? You, but also, <laughs> how fast do you think that a woman can run the marathon? Because the current world record, I think, is 216. Is that right? Uh, so it just got lowered this year to 214. 214. There you go. Last year, sorry. Last yeah. year. Was that Bridget? Yeah. Yeah. How fast do you think you can do it? And how fast do you think female or women can do it? So, yeah, that's a tricky question. So female women, I'll go with first. Um, it's a little bit hard to know at the moment in distance running what is real and what is not. And I don't know what if I can really say this, but there's a, a huge doping problem in marathon running and it, it's, it's quite hard for me to fathom that a girl can run a marathon in under two hours and 15 minutes naturally, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what the limits are as far as what people can do <laughs> the right way, but I, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's a lot faster than what has been done already, if any. Uh, myself, I like to think that I still have some minutes to take off my marathon time. Uh, my race in Nagoya last year, which was 226, it certainly wasn't a perfect race. It was good conditions and things like that. But um, You had a little toilet yeah, break, hoping, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I had a few uh, stomach issues, <laughs> so I had to have a stop. Um, luckily, it was in Japan where there are portaloos basically the whole way along the course. Uh, but yeah, I, th- I think that I could maybe if I can keep keep training consistently for the next five years or so, I like to think that I could maybe take another three or four minutes off that time, potentially, which would be cool. Um, I think it's going under two hours 20 as a female is very that's yeah um there are very few people that can can do that that's some serious pace so, and can we just go back to some juicy content that you just laid down you think <laughs> you said that marathoning or marathon running and long distance events there's a lot of doping let's let's dive yeah. into that so what what are we talking in terms of what are they using? So there's probably some, some stuff that we don't even know about as well. Well, There there would um, be a lot of stuff we don't know about. That's for sure. Yeah. So that I think there's some new drug tests actually coming out soon that they're not really releasing what they're going to be testing for or anything at this stage, probably so that, um, that the people that are using it don't know they're about to be tested for it. But there's like EPO is obviously huge in endurance sports and, they have a system where they uh, use a blood passport to try and detect EPO use, but there's all sorts of ways that people can get around that. So there's micro dosing and um, blood doping. And it, it all depends on when you've been tested and the, the ranges that you have to be in to be uh, convicted, I guess, of doping it that, it has to be like your blood results have to be so far out of what is possibly normal that it's a hundred percent. Basically um, they can be a hundred percent sure that you are, are cheating. So like I've actually done a bit of reading about the, the different scores and things. And, and I look at my own blood scores and they're just so far below what is considered to be possibly normal. So it's pretty, um, yeah, it's pretty rampant. And, and in Australia, like Asada, we've got a really good anti-doping program here, but it's, it's not the same in every country and there's a lot of corruption. And yeah, unfortunately, where there's money in sport, there's, there's drugs and there's, there is money in, in marathon running now. And there's also, um, I mean, for a lot of people that are living in poverty in some of the East African countries, like for them to win one race sets them and their family up for life. So there's a, a little more on the line, I think, for a lot of those athletes. And we have to probably have some understanding of, of that as well. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's tricky because, you know, when you go to a, a, like a major marathon or an international event that it's not really a, a level playing field. But, yeah, unfortunately, they're not catching many. Surely, the, surely though, you couldn't justify someone cheating even if they were from East Africa, if they were trying to obviously get their family set up. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't justify it. Sorry, I've just got to put my phone on the charger. Um, But it, I guess sometimes uh, there's a lot on the line for those people. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Have you, have you watched the 30 for 30 Lance Armstrong documentary? Uh, Yes. I hang on. Sorry. I just need to get my, thing to work this is live and unedited as well (laughs) okay um yeah i did watch that actually it was interesting yeah it was very interesting and highly recommended to everyone out there have a watch it definitely and there's there's the other documentary the armstrong liar that's really good about the whole armstrong saga but he was kind of like the best of a bad best of a bad bunch really they're all doping Oh, that's it. Yeah. Cycling, cycling and cycling's got a really bad reputation for it. But um, yeah, I think, I think that long distance running is really not that far behind, to be honest. 
Wow, this is huge. I didn't. I did not expect you to say that, but <laughs> I'm I'm loving the juicy content there. That's great. I'm not. I'm not naming any names oh, or know, speculating it's... on who is doping, but yeah, it's it's definitely um something that's happening in our sport. But you can't you can't spend your whole life worrying about that though because it's yeah. You just got to keep training and do the best you can do. Exactly. You can't control it and you just got to do the best you can. So, and you're clearly doing that. And hopefully these, these injuries and these little niggles settle quickly, Ellie, because obviously 2021 is creeping up next, next year. And hopefully that yeah. you're, you know, we're cheering you on at Tokyo. Yeah, hopefully. Got to, got to get there healthy and uninjured and get selected for the team first. But yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Now, where can people find you, Ellie, in terms of if they want any help with their running programming and also your Instagram uh, website, anything like that? Yep. So uh, Julian and I, Julian's my coach, we've got a, an online coaching business called Run Strong Online Coaching. And so our we've got an Instagram page that's just Run Strong Online Coaching and then a website that's runstrongonlinecoaching.com.au. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Ellie Opash. I'm not, I'm not great on Instagram, to be honest, but um, I'm there. So, yeah, that's probably the best place to follow. Sweet. Thank you so much for coming on. You've been a wealth of knowledge and a lot of the listeners out there, especially the runners, will get a lot out of this. And I think one of the biggest things that you said is exactly what I want you to, wanted you to say is do more Ks at a slower intensity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah, don't neglect you, your speed work. If you're going to do work. anything, you should do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And don't neglect then your speed work. Then worry about work. the other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Don't forget your strength yeah. training too. Yes. Yep. Yeah, of course. And are you going to leave, leave the, uh, the listeners with any knowledge nuggets to finish up? <laughs> knowledge nuggets. Yep. What do you I'm got? I'm going to say that be patient because it might take you four or five years to get to a point where you can achieve what you want to achieve in running and even to get your body to a point where it can handle a significant amount of running load without getting injured so sometimes you've just got to ride those ride those waves of of little injuries and setbacks and they usually uh, highlight your weaknesses and things that you need to work on with strength and things like that. So if you can, if you can just stick at it for a few years, that's when you really get the results because consistency I think is, is the big thing over time. So yeah, be patient. Great. Great advice, Ellie. Thank you so much. And when all these COVID restrictions lift, hopefully you come up to Sydney soon and we'll have a beer. Yeah, that'd be good. Turn back the clock like we're at Patty's again, hey? <laughs> Yeah, I don't drink as many beers as I used to drink back then, that's for sure. <laughs> you didn't mind a beer back in the day? <laughs> yeah. A bit yeah, more I don't tame. think anyone minds a beer at Charles Sturt Uni. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, thanks again. We'll do it again soon. Uh, we've got a lot out of this. I think we could definitely do a 2.0, so we'll be in touch. Cool. Thanks, Wildy. Pleasure. This podcast is brought to you by Wild Physio Fitness. You can find me at wildphysiofitness.com.au and Wild Physio Fitness on all socials. Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This podcast is live on both of them. Leave a five-star rating review if you can on Apple Podcasts. That would be good. And as usual, stay strong.